This is the Conscious Economics Podcast. Your co-hosts are two women who found themselves in careers on Bay Street, but decided that there was something missing. So here we are. I'm Rhiannon Rosalind. I'm your co-host and the CEO of the Economic Club of Canada. I'm also the co-founder of Conscious Economics. Hi, I'm a SEAL, the CEO of Conscious Economics and a financial therapist. Now, we call ourselves economic healers, and that is a term that I'm sure nobody has heard before, but we really believe that if we want to heal our systems and create a more equitable society, it starts with actually healing our relationship with money and the economy. When you join us on this podcast, you'll be exposed to courageous conversations that help us examine, heal, and redefine the relationship we have with money. Join us on this journey as we co-create the new economy together. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Conscious Economics Podcast. I am Rhiannon. And I'm a seal, and here we're here to talk to you today about profit and purpose. These two words usually seem anecdotal. However, we are here to make the point that when we look at them in harmony, there's so much more production and fulfillment that can be generated out of our work. Um, and while this conversation can go into so many different tangents and target very different groups of people, we will focus more on how it impacts the artists specifically for many reasons. First, because as an organization, we do work with a lot of artists and we understand the struggles that they go through. Uh, but however, the second point, which is also important, we believe there's an artist in everybody, in mm -hmm. every profession. Yeah. And having uh, the ability to bring that creativity and passion to work is really important for our society to move forward. Yeah, I think many of us have been sort of indoctrinated with this belief that work has to kind of be boring mm -hmm. and that making money can come from creative pursuits. So I think this is what we're here to explore today. Is that really true? And what, why? Why do we have those belief systems and how can we work to change them? So of course. what are you going to teach me? Well, <laughs> first, I actually, in preparation of, so I have notes as usual, but in preparation of this episode, I recall the story of one of my friends who was creating, he, he he has a full-time job as um, a landscaper and when on the side because he's just a creative person he was he's an actually uh, he's an architect from Mexico but in Canada he's taking time to create equivalency to his degree uh, so he lot he does a lot of creative projects on the side to fulfill his creative outlet mm -hmm. and expression and what's interesting and is he, he created a beautiful piece of art um, that you know anybody can buy from him so people were encouraging him to start his own account on Etsy or Instagram or something like that um, and I, I, I personally ordered a piece from him because it was just a beautiful piece of work. And when he told me the price, I was like, wait, this is like really undercharged. Like I, I felt that this price doesn't represent at all the piece and how much work and delicacy is going into it. So when I asked him, why are you charging so little for this? I was just trying to bring it to his attention that it just, it, it just didn't seem right. His response was, well, if I start making money out of this, then it's not going to be fun anymore. It's not going to be uh, my passion will die because now I have the stress about um, owning up to that price. And then the stress that comes with the fact that now this is a, an income generating uh, vehicle instead of it being an outlet for expression and passion. And I really was interested in that specific conversation. Obviously, I don't agree with him. And I actually started coaching him around it to help him reframe how he's looking at it. But when I say this, I'm pretty sure a lot of artists fall in that category where they and I have a lot of different things here to share. Uh, but a lot of it has to do with societal uh, limiting beliefs as well that that we project on these artists that, you know, when you when you want to create a or pursue a career of art a lot of your family and friends start asking you like why don't you get a real job mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. d diminishing art in itself being a, a career yeah i think we've definitely definitely diminished art um I, I i kind of come back to this story of there was someone who came into a school classroom and went to each classroom from kindergarten to grade eight and asked you know inside the classroom who here is an artist and from the younger grades kindergarten like up to grade two 
everyone raised their hand and identified themselves as an artist. But as they went further into the older grades, there were only a few hands up at the end by the time they got to grade eight. So it is something that I think we're conditioned to believe isn't a vehicle for, you know, a profit generating. um, uh, And that's not totally true. Obviously, we can think of lots of artists that are generating income from their work many musicians and people but we just don't seem to see enough examples of people being able to be profitable and financially successful while also going after that passion or their you know creative purpose Mm -hmm. so it's really interesting to kind of look at that and um, I have some of this showing up in my own life even of areas that I wouldn't believe that I would be able to generate income from versus areas that I would like I remember doing lots of events through the economic club that I maybe wasn't so interested in but they paid well and then sometimes the ones that I really wanted to host on the platform uh, because they were personal social justice issues that I was passionate about or whatever else tended to be ones that weren't generating revenue so I don't know like and that was true for me that was like a legitimate Mm -hmm. thing that was happening yeah so let's 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 actually dig into this and I have some symptoms here that usually show up and surface in the typical starving artist syndrome so let's go through it and and reflect as you share this scenario with us which one of these limiting beliefs potentially uh, sabotaged the success out of these events that you created for yourself Uh, because because ultimately, and, and the reason I say that, and it's an important point to kind of make before we get into it, is the, the attitudes are very subtle uh, and they sabotage our uh, results. And, and it's all about mindset. So sometimes the, the experiences that we create are ultimately generated and projected from limiting beliefs that we're holding on to. Mm-hmm. So if this is a belief system that we're operating from that whether it's society and our bringing helped us reinforce constantly over and over again that the things we're passionate about are simply not going to be the income generating or the profit generating uh, vehicles of our lives, then we're going to continuously reinforce that reality in anything we do. But let's get uh, more specific about how these symptoms show up for the starving artist. Uh, And I do want to make the point again here that even if you're not an artist listening to this podcast, these limiting beliefs can still be showing up in your own life. And it's something that you want to reflect on because we all crave passion. So artists are, are known to be like the archetype to where passion is like absolute necessity for their job. But I would argue that passion is important for all humans to thrive and be fulfilled. Absolutely. So, so this yeah. episode is for you, even if you're not an artist as well. So the first one is the limited thinking. And that goes in saying things like, of course I'm starving or of course I'm broke. I'm an artist after all. Because even even though it sounds like a, a harmless cliche, it really caused a lot of conflict in us because words matter. So when when you tell people, of course I'm broke because I'm an artist, then it's simply highlighting how limiting that belief is. Mm-hmm. So do you relate or can you um, reflect on the artists that you've worked with or maybe even yourself in, in, in showing in, um, indulging with cliches like this? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I I was a musician earlier in my life. I was in a band and we were gigging, you know, across the province and we loved, we loved doing the shows. It was exhilarating being out there, but we just accepted that like essentially we'd be playing for beer money and this was fine like we didn't really we never really thought about asking for more or doing Mm. more because we were just like so happy to be there and do it and so happy to perform so and I think that that's a lot of the time because the passion and the purpose of doing the work is so innate and ingrained for artists you know, money kind of is an afterthought and Mm. there is a really interesting um, piece to zone in on, perhaps not in this episode, around the idea of creatives or creators uh, being a little bit less driven by the almighty dollar Mm -hmm. and that it's actually like, it almost feels like these two things don't go together um artists are typically speaking out sort of against the you know traditional culture and and trying to sort of be offside and and outside of the regular framework of the nine to five or like working for the man or whatever that is so money sometimes is associated with the man or the standard or the thing that as artists we're trying to like break against Mm -hmm. so that's an interesting point for sure 
This podcast is brought to you by our sponsor, RBC Investees. Backed by expert human advisors, RBC Investees is a smart, online, automated investment service that allows you to invest with low effort and low cost. Open your first RBC Investees account and pay no management fees for your first year. Plus, start investing with as little as $100. Simply visit rbcinvestees.com slash getinvesting and sign up using promo code AA407. For me, the way this showed up in my life, as far as limiting thinking is concerned, is the societal reinforcement of that message. So I grew up in Lebanon, and in grade 10, you actually have to, there's a fork in the road that you create uh, in your academical journey, and that's either choosing an artistic side or a scientific side. And then in grade 11, that further branches into like philosophy and or socioeconomical studies. And if you chose the scientific, then you either further study science or further study math Mm. that's how these like career um not career sorry academic projections are so you're either going towards science and math or you're going towards art art and as a society there's oh there's this perception that people who are less intelligent Mm -hmm. go towards art people who are less ambitious go towards art and it's constantly being reinforced so I recall having the grades that allowed me to have that choice because if you don't have good grades then art is just the default Uh, it's such bad messaging and programming and it's so not true and I just want to again reiterate that these are deeply ingrained belief systems that we see showing up in the current economy and conscious economics is really about pushing against these belief systems Mm -hmm honoring artists honoring the inner artist and really understanding that art is a part of the movement towards building this mm-hmm. new more inclusive economy so what are some of the other beliefs absolutely that are programmed in? so the second one is hope marketing <laughs> I know. what is that exactly i was really interested when i came across that one so that's you thinking that you actually don't need a planner or strategy for your career it's really basing your success on hope and say- saying things well i'm just a good person and if I just get better at what I do then surely enough my career will pick up and really just basing the success of your career trajectory on hopeful wishful thinking that's not really backed by proper strategy and proper business planning Mm -hmm. and that's a lot to do with artists in general don't see their um, artistry as business when in reality it is and I know this is a lot of the things we try to do as an organization as well is really build that infrastructure to help artists see themselves as entrepreneurs see themselves as business owners and and their art is essentially part of that product and services they offer I think sometimes when you are literally your own product so it's like your hand that paint it's your voice that sings or plays an instrument or whatever um whatever that practice may be yeah there's this idea like I don't need a business plan for just who I innately am and what I innately do exactly but yeah I can see why that would definitely um hinder that artist's ability to get especially in today's day and age when there is so much out there and so much available in terms of the internet and everyone being connected but strategy is needed and so yeah I can't just economics who are constantly trying to help artists see themselves as entrepreneurs and co-creators of that new economy Mm -hmm. so yeah that makes sense the third one is showing up not committed I mean that goes without saying for anybody in any profession really but really not being willing to stick to the disciplines that you need to create the successes that you deserve or desire um, and ultimately settling with a status quo so this is just a straightforward one and even though it's subtle sometimes there ha- there is usually a, this non-committal especially an artist because they have they like this um, element of uncertainty sometimes it shows up in sabotaging behaviors like not committing to something Mm. um, because of the spontaneity they like to have um, from just the lifestyle they they are motivated by but the second one which is really important after this one is not taking care of themselves and this shows up to so many people and the root of that is really a deeper sense of unworthiness and that's a lot to do with again the societal framing about uh, who chooses the path of artists and just 
looking at them as less important than other professions. Uh, but it's very interesting because when artists are not taking care of themselves, then they really are just um, unable to protect the vision that they fully, fully care about. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So interesting. I think that goes without saying for everyone, though, that when we take care of ourselves and when we focus on our well-being, both men- mentally, emotionally, physically, that does lead to better financial outcomes mm-hmm. for people. So it makes a lot of sense that this would be connected and not just for artists, but for everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, something that I think I'm learning, we're all learning that that's a big part of it. Um, and um, yeah. So I'm going to actually go through some of the ways these symptoms show up because we just went through categories. I mean, mean the last two categories I'll mention briefly here is being a victim and that's simply accepting stories and excuses to why you you are um, who you are and why you're in the situation you're in. And sabotaging yourself is actually the, the subconscious ways in which you get in the way of your own success which we talk about all the time but let me read to you some of the ways these symptoms actually show up beyond these categories from a deeper perspective so first it's believing that it's not okay to make money doing what you love and you you insinuated about this point earlier uh, and it's a very very common one because it's almost as if making money out of something you love um, taints it But I do understand that feeling that uh, there's people who create because they create when they feel called to it or it just kind of happens naturally. And when you start to put business parameters around that, when you start to try to ensure that that, you know, that outlet is profitable, it does change the way that it has to be done. So, for instance, if I'm just painting and enjoying that as a, you know my process and that there's beautiful pieces that may come out of it but if I have a list of 10 customers that are expecting that painting for a gift for someone or whatever all of a sudden now there's deadlines and timelines and parameters on my creativity so I do understand that um dilemma yeah that dilemma like it it does make a lot of sense for me in some ways and I think that that is where um we need to be able to consciously practice how do we actually tap into that creativity like some people feel like they just stumble across their creativity but there is science to how this all works Mm -hmm. and how we can actually optimize ourselves so that we can put more parameter around our creative flow and Mm -hmm. we can find that process and we can be abundant through that and create a business that doesn't mean that we have to be chained to a desk now and chained to clients um, but it does mean that we can kind of function and break through some of those barriers that society places Mm -hmm. on us as creators so it's like that fine balance in between and I think that that's where the gap is is that folks don't understand how to tap into what that is Mm -hmm. and create parameters around things while still existing as an independent you know revolutionary creator so yeah there's the absolutely uh legitimate points and it really good uh to give context to these things but the other layer to that is if you don't think on a deeper level that it's okay to make money out of something you love that's because there's usually negative associations with what money means and Mm -hmm. what money represents so it's beyond just these deadlines and the hinder hinder the hindered creativity that comes out of this pressure because that pressure exists even if you're not an artist any person with a deadline ex- is exposing himself or herself to a stress level uh, but but the association of of turning a passion to an income generating vehicle if you don't have if you don't have peace with money and you have a uh, sabotage relationship with that you know resource in our life then you're not going to be comfortable of it coming from a space that you really love and that's the deeper layer and I think that that is really really common yes um and then uh, especially when you're you know your community is a huge influence on the way that you think about these things like money so if you are a creative and you hang out with a lot of creatives and everybody's kind of indoctrinated with that same idea then it's just a kind of perpetual self fulfilling prophecy and Mm -hmm. that is something that you know we definitely want to break but I think the first question for people that are listening creatives artists is like you have to ask yourself that question do I want to have my 
art or my work generate a, an income for me that is abundant? And you have to ask yourself that question and you have to answer yes to that and then start doing the work mm-hmm. and unpacking it because it is absolutely possible. But if we don't even know that we want that or if there's a disconnection between actually saying we want that and that feels icky inside, mm-hmm. there's more work to do. Like mm-hmm. you said, before we could even start. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I met a lot of people who actually have like part-time jobs on the side just to help them get by while they're trying to establish their artistic careers or whatnot but the interesting thing is uh we will get into this in future episodes in much more deeper detail but there's something called mental accounting which means that you treat dollars differently depending on where they come from and how they come into your life so even though a dollar is a dollar is a dollar but a dollar created uh in a in your part-time job bartending is spent very differently by a dollar made from your art for example Mm -hmm. and that's because even though it's the at face value a dollar is a dollar we treat it differently because there's an energy behind how money comes into our life and what it represents Mm -hmm. Uh, so I find that really interesting but another thing um, artists have attached themselves is by thinking that um, they just have to sell their soul or compromise their values. That's also a very big one that we hear in our own uh, community that of artists that we serve, but also in the broader societal context. So why do you think that is? Like that, that phrase itself, I have to sell my soul or mm-hmm. compromise my values. Well, I think a lot of the times when people are trying to generate an income from their art, they feel like they may have to adjust their art for the particular client or person that's purchasing it. I know a lot of artists that I talk to feel really kind of icky about doing corporate gigs because they feel like, oh, great, like I'm selling my soul or now here I am and I have to like adjust myself to this organization. And so, again, I think when we go deeper into the layers of indoctrination (laughs) is what I'm calling it, um, the psychology of these issues, one of the things that feels really true to me is when I think about the tables turning and when I think about um, being able to reestablish power structures, meaning that we're trying to build more equal and inclusive economies and societies, having lots of people who are creatives, who think outside the box, who are different, who do challenge the norm, not wanting to accumulate wealth for themselves equals not wanting to take that reign of power. And in order to be able to have new influences in our society, we need new people to step into those positions of power. So if artists were to open themselves to Mm -hmm. accumulating that wealth, money is sort of a a amplification of who you already are. Mm -hmm. When I've received lots of money in my lifetime, I've done like really cool, kick-ass, revolutionary things with it, and I've been able to redistribute it um, into communities and folks that wouldn't have otherwise had it and create things that didn't exist before. So I think that we need to kind of reframe that, Mm -hmm. but it's such a common piece. And without further and deeper psychological investigation at surface value, it makes a lot of sense Mm -hmm. so yeah and that's why we well that's why we exist first as individuals second as an organization and third as a podcast we really are trying to demystify these particular belief systems that we just hold and and continue holding on to um, in our lives that show up in different ways and really start restructuring them in ways that not only serve us but also serve the families and the communities around us that we care about because once we change then this change is a ripple has a ripple effect on the people around us so we're approaching our end here and I really want us to think about what we want to leave their listeners with so here's what I my takeaway for you is uh, we've planted a lot of seeds about what can be potentially getting in the way and sabotaging the success that's coming out of your own passion and if you really think that going into your job means leaving your passion at the door then you're really not just doing yourself a disservice you're doing the employer that you're going into a disservice your clients a disservice everybody is disserviced by that limiting belief when we find ways to really heal the relationship we have with money and integrate our passion with purpose and profit then we can just 
exponentially expedite our success and also have much more fulfillment in, in that path. So yeah. this is really my my takeaway from this. Um, and we're going to continue exploring ways and how we can do that because yeah. we identified there's a problem, but there's lots of ways in which we can tackle it. Yeah, there's more to this um, conversation for sure. But to anyone that's listening, I just want to say that I really believe in a world and a society where artists are remunerated fairly, where yeah. artists have more power to be able to influence the social structures and be able to comment on them whether it be through your art or just your own voice being at the table so thank you for everyone um, who's tuned in and listened and we will see you next week with more uh, from the conscious economics podcast let us know your thoughts and follow us at conscious economics or conscious economics.ca take care This podcast is brought to you by CPP Investments. At CPP Investments, they never lose sight of the long term. They invest the Canadian Pension Plan Fund to help provide financial security for generations of Canadians. They diversify the CPP fund across geographies and asset classes to access the best investment opportunities and generate sustainable long-term returns. The fund is now more than $400 billion. To learn more about their investment performance for Canadians, visit cppinvestments.com.